Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups. And my guest today is Jordan Levy. Jordan, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Thank you for having us. It's really, really great to be with you here, Kevin. I'm anxious to uh, to get rolling, but I'd like to give our guests a chance at the very first of the chat to kind of share your life experience and family situation and where you're living and, and work experience all within about two minutes. So <laughs> you got so, the floor. Sounds like a good way to get started. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I have been my entire career. I started uh, my first business while I was a student at Lehigh University. I was graduating as a senior and kind of realized that I didn't want to do anything that had uh, pretty much anything to do with my major of accounting and finance and was kind of at a loss trying to figure out like, oh, wow, like if I don't want to do that, what am I going to do? And I kind of realized during that process that I didn't really have um, channels and, and professional connections enough to really you know, figure that out. And so I kind of you know, have slowly but surely created a business around learning um, myself and also helping others learn. And, um, you know, my, my, you know, my experience um, since college has been, you know, a variety of different startups. Um, first one was, you know, in person in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, some called the DMV. Um, and I really enjoyed that experience. And, you know, took a lot from it, you know, raised money and, and, you know, kind of learned, you know, if you can jolt a business with capital, you know, how do you manage that capital? What, mm, how, do you set sure. goals, how do you create an organization? And um, since then, I actually, you know, I realized that so much of the building startup process can be done virtually. Um, and it takes a lot of pressure off of the team um, that like, you know, everyone's got to show up to the same office and, and kind of breathe the same air. And I think obviously that's been kind of reaffirmed by the whole, you know, post COVID situation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So ever since COVID I've been on the road, um, I've been building a capsule to the virtual startup since 2017. Um, but truly you know, took advantage of that remote culture by, you know, living across um, 11 U S states over the course of the last uh, nine, 10 months um, have really enjoyed learning a lot about, you know, the U.S. culture and history across the entire mountain time zone, parts of the South, and now I'm in Florida. So I'm um, enjoying some some sunshine, some tennis, some golf, um, and uh, of course, a lot of good work with great people. Well, I, I want to really dive into CapSource, but before we we touch on that a little bit, I'm curious, let's, let's go back to kind of your, you know, junior, senior year at Lehigh. So what was the, what can, I mean, looking back now, what was kind of the trigger that you would say, I, I can't work for anybody. I, I got to work for myself. What was, you know, can you look back in like your family lineage and think, you know, everybody's an entrepreneur in my family. And of course I just kind of carried on the family tradition or I, I really broke, broke rank here. Yeah. Well, so I think that's something I always talk about is like, you know, if you don't have a parent who can be a professional mentor, you have to find other routes to get that yeah. mentorship. So, you know, my mom, um, fortunately was able to not work. My dad he was primary breadwinner in our house. He was an immigrant, um, true immigrant story came in his twenties, um, got, went to college, went to med school, and then ultimately started a private practice. So he's got, you know, a little bit of that entrepreneurship, you know, bone in his body yeah. and intuition, but, you know, truly um, nothing in common with his trade of ophthalmology. Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot from him characteristically, but you, know, you asked, when did I kind of learn that I wanted to be an entrepreneur? Um, I always knew I wanted to be like, in the business world, which was was definitely different from from my parents, um, also my you know my aunts and uncles, most mm -hmm. of them are not involved in the business world, um, with the exception of my grandfather who was an accountant and my uncle who was also you know a, a trained CPA turned you know financial officer, so um, you know basically had that in my lineage of of, hey, go, you know, accounting is a reliable career. Uh, you know, Lehigh's accounting program is one of the best for undergrads in the nation. And, you know, I got advice from, uh, you know, brother in my fraternity when we were talking about studies 
that the best job placements were out of accounting and finance from the business school. And so I kind of blindly followed that. And <laughs> what I realized that I was not a good fit for accounting and finance was obviously the one opportunity I got to intern. I was a camp counselor until my junior year. And then finally my junior year, I got a chance to intern at KPMG. Yeah. And, you know, I used, to, I was commuting between my house where I grew up in Long Island and um, New York City. I was on the Madison Square Garden project. I was, you know, I actually got into a thing called the build your own internship program where you've got to tr- choose two different practices to do an internship in. And so I did financial transactions as well as an advisory. And like, that's the ideal situation for interns. They get, you know, to network and do a whole lot of different projects and meet people. And I didn't like any of it. I didn't like corporate culture. I didn't like the commute. I didn't like what I had to wear. I didn't like the bureaucracy of how you communicate with who and when. Um, And I think the, you know, when I fully noticed that this was not going to work for me, was um, a conversation I was having with my mom actually. And I, you know, I used to get home from work and she would say to me, she was like, how was your day? And I was like, it's fine, you know, whatever. And so she'd be like, what'd you eat for lunch? Um, And then I would be like, oh my God, like New York City, like this deli, that sandwich, this sushi, like three roll combo. And like, that would make me the most excited, like of anything I reflected on for the day. And so after this happened, like two weeks in a row towards the end of my internship, my mom was like, she's like, you realize you're, you're not excited about work, but you're excited about the working world. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, you're, you're excited to talk about, you know, you're, your lunch and who you went to lunch with and like nothing to do with what you're actually doing at, at work. Like, do you think you want to stay there? And, you know, at the time I never even thought that there was another option. I was just like, well, I, I, this is my life now. I, you know, I went to school, I did what I had to, I got good grades. I got into a a really good accounting firm with job security and, and benefits. And, you know, that just, it just wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted. And so I really, I really didn't know what I wanted, which was even more the problem and kind of my inspiration for, you know, creating, you know, creating a solution that could work for other students that don't have, you know, that family network that don't have the privilege of getting internship right. Um, right. that really want that opportunity. And that's, that's such a, I, I love that the point you just made about the, so, okay, I figured out what I didn't want to do. Now I've got to figure out what I do want to do. And I think so many, you know, especially young, uh, you know, college grads, you know, students, they, they're in that quandary, you know, they're like, what am I, you know, so I've got, I've got this degree and I've had internships and I've had some job offers and I don't really want to do those, but I really do not know what I want to do. So walk us through the kind of the, the, the thought process. I mean, where you're sitting in your dorm room or you're sitting in your front, front house room, you're going, Okay, so I don't want to do that. So what can I do? So I'm going to get on the internet and look up ways to make money 101. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, um, we really started by asking questions to the people that were surrounding us, which were educators, and you know, they're excellent at educating. They're not necessarily. Um, you know, folks with industry experience. So now you made only... a big jump there. You went from, I didn't have an idea to, we talked to educators. You left a whole lot out in that, in that transition. So who's we, and how did you end up even in the edge ed, ed, ed space or ed tech space? Yeah. I mean, because we were in school, right? Like, I, Oh, I, okay. Yeah. So I was still in school and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I, realized I didn't want to go back to KPMG after my senior year was over. You know, th- for, thankfully, the entrepreneurship that program at Lehigh was very experiential, right? It was like, go figure out how to build a startup. Uh, that was pretty much my capstone course mm. for my entrepreneurship program. And so I was just meandering through the halls, basically asking my professors, like, why don't you guys do more stuff with industry? Like, why isn't that built into the curriculum? Why you know, why, why aren't we immersed into the business world? And so, you know, the reality is we started asking them questions. We started saying, hey, you know, if we built products that connected the classroom more, you know, with a company, would that be interesting to you? Like if, you know, we produce content, would that be interesting to you? Do you think you would need a platform? How would you use it? And then basically we convinced a couple of professors to like literally give us an entire class session to teach our friends as opposed to them teaching us whatever was originally scheduled, which 
you know, to this very day, I think was one of the elements of the culture of Lehigh that I, I am, I'm still addicted to. And I still love is that, you know, if you really want to make it happen there, you can co-create your experience with, you know, the, the faculty around you. And, you know, what we started to do was, you know, say to the faculty, okay, what do you want to teach? And one of them was like global marketing, anything to do with global marketing, that's the case study we want. And then we would go out and find a company that was willing to talk about their global marketing challenge. And that's what we basically have been working on ever since uh, graduating Lehigh was reverse engineering what it means to gain experience, right? It's experiential learning, right? Right. So we broke it down and said, okay, experiential learning means that you have reference worthy experience. I have something that I can reference that I can ultimately use as a form of experience to get more experience, to get in the door, to get hired, to get, you know, um, ahead of the herd. And so that's, that's basically where, where we started and kind of how we began to ideate around, you know, the, the solution that, you know, ideally is a fit for anyone, you know, that's, that's in the age bracket of 16 to 34 years old and just needs a new perspective, needs a new outlook on life, needs a new career path. And, you know, doesn't want to go, you know, you know, back to school or back into the job funnel, the endless job funnels that are out there. And so that's, you know, the reality is graduate programs are kind of tailored to that audience and undergrad right. programs are tailored to the high school pre-professional audience. And, you know, we're, our product works for both. We have high school students, you know, engaging in some of our programs. We have, you know, lots of undergrads across engineering and various business and STEM fields. And then we have graduate students that are you know, up to you know, early to mid thirties that are, you know, restarting their career or transitioning from, you know, uh, service oriented jobs to real, you know, real careers. And so that's where experiential learning comes in because people need to taste the flavors, right? Like you don't know what your flavor is, um, you know, favorite flavor of ice cream if you've only ever had one, right? So you were just scratching your own itch. I mean, <laughs> you, you created something that you, I wish I would have had this when I was a sen, you know, junior or senior at Lehigh after my KPMG time to figure out, to figure this out. But so you and I, you know, I stepped on an elevator. We're going to go up 10 floors. You got about 45 seconds. Give me your elevator pitch for okay. CapSource. So CapSource is an education technology company that helps industry and academic partners build and manage internship programs that provides students with reference worthy experience and ultimately inspires, you know, our next generation to learn more about the products that are out there um, and potentially join the teams that, you know, that inspire them. And so that is CapSource in a nutshell. Um, we're a technology provider. We offer software uh, as a service and we also offer um, some additional added services to really make the most of that software experience. Ding, elevator door opens. I get out. I turn back around and I say, do you have a card? And I take your business card and then I call you later and I've got some follow-up questions. So how's the, what's the pricing model? Who, who, who funds the, I mean, do the students pay to be in the program? Do the companies pay to have the internships? Do the universities pay to have, you know, some involvement in the, in the program? Is it a combination of all of the above? Yes. Yeah, so we, um, we have two revenue sources. Um, academic partners, which are schools and their students, and then industry partners, which are the companies. Obviously, both very essential in building uh, experiential learning programs and internship programs and um, you know, providing students with career readiness and helping them transition from education to work. So um, the academic partners um, can enlist CapSource to help build their programs, um, which means finding companies, structuring the experience, and helping to launch and manage the experience. Um, the other thing that CapSource can do is provide technology um, to schools that want to build and manage their own programs. Mm -hmm. and so that's really our enterprise technology solution. Right, right. Uh, on the industry side, we're trying to accomplish the same thing. If they want to build internship programs, we will help support that process, which is all about matching with you know, schools and students and ultimately uh, building and managing that internship program. Um, and then what we're working on, which is not yet available, is kind of an, a white label kind of enterprise software solution for companies as well. Um, so really, it's a full ecosystem 
um, freemium, right? You, mm -hmm. We want to provide you know the companies, educators, and students with something to do on the platform for free, which is something we're working on, and ultimately you know, upgrade them to premium based on you know what we know that they need um, and where they need the most help. And that's you know right now a lot of the service, but hopefully as we continue to evolve as a business, it will be more of a software product feature or set of features that they're paying for. Um, so that's really our, our kind of big goal and, and roadmap ahead. So what is the what is the solution that the software is specifically speaking to? And then I want to kind of circle back with something you said about the, you know, how the how the the pieces integrate. But specifically on the software, I'd, I'd heard you mention that as well on another interview that you did about how it's almost like a bit of a surprise where you've had, you know, some of the companies have come back and requested, you know, hey, can we white label this? Can we use this as a, as a solution type thing? So unpack that a little bit because I, I was a little fuzzy on exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. So right now the software um, provides educators and students and the companies that they partner with, it provides them with structure around Build, building and managing a collaboration, an internship like right. collaboration. Okay. Um, so students are often put in groups. Um, those groups of students are working on real projects. For example, a go-to-market strategy for you know DoorDash post-COVID, you know, to mm. work on meal plans for a college student environment. Um, you know, other examples are um, supply chain uh, challenges. And, you know, deciding whether to you know, continue to use FedEx and third-party fulfillment or to go with uh, a homegrown branded solution, you know, where you're ultimately providing uh, a, that layer of service to your customers. And so students are getting a chance to interface with the professionals using the structure of our platform. Um, they're getting a chance to upload deliverables and, and work within their teams. And then they ultimately, um, they get to walk away with credentials and badges and and that experience. Um, and so the big challenge that we're trying to solve is, you know, it's it's hard to match on these types of yeah. opportunities. Yeah. So that the first is the first aspect is like, can we bring people together? The second is, can we then structure the expectations so that it really is a meaningful learning experience for the students? And, you know, obviously is beneficial for the industry partners as well. And then, you know, the last aspect is, you know, can we help them manage that, mm -hmm. that process? And, yep. you know, that's a lot about performance reviews and, and reflections and ensuring that students have the information that they need, you know, educators where they're involved, you know, you know is, are their students performing? Do they need any more assistance? Is intervention needed? And then obviously companies, you know, can upload materials and, you know, continue to provide feedback on how the project is going from their perspective. I, I can imagine it's like CRM, CRM meets training modules meets you know, marketing database. I mean, it just, it's, it is, I, I can, as you were talking, I mean, my, my little entrepreneurial gears are spinning thinking, man, I can even see like post internship, you know, usage for this data. I could, I could see, you know, how you're matching. I mean, just because you had an internship at this one company doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to continue with them. Maybe it's not a good fit. Maybe, you know, there's another company that wants to hire you full time based on the internship you had with company A, you know, yeah. or, or something like that. And, or, I could even see like it, this could be used by a, a university as as a recruitment tool to bring students into a program even, you know, to say, you know, that you're bringing students to Lehigh, you know, as as students in the entrepreneurial program or in this in this apprenticeship. So there's I think there's a there is a lot of uses that, you know, that uh, and it's, it's probably like, you know, you're this is 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, you know, that you've got you know, written in a secret notebook somewhere that, you know, okay, in 2022, we're going to launch this, you know? So yeah. I love the, I love the way that you've thought through this process. Uh, I've had, um, I've had other people in the ed tech space that, that we've interviewed on rising tide and, you know, like uncollege, you know, mentality. And, and we've had people that are just specifically training, like maybe just coding, you know, that they're so granular in, in their approach and, so I'm, I'm curious to your, your thoughts. It seems like to me that you're wanting to work within the kind of the traditional educational system, but it's almost like you're wanting to disrupt it a little bit too, at the same time. 
well, if you're going to make a big difference in the world, you're going to have to disrupt some norms, right? So I think, you know, I, I believe strongly that what, what, like one of our biggest exports as a country is education. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't think it's in anyone's best interest to kind of stomp on their parade. I think they have a very unique model. I think they do need help transitioning to, you know, more experiential learning focus as opposed mm-hmm. to content focus. Uh, obviously, theory is is rooted in content because the content is built to address, you know, the theory. Where right. the reality is, if you're not applying that theory to real situations, then you actually mo- don't retain most of it. Um, and so like, you know, that's the, the struggle that I've, I always had with my accounting degree is like, you know, you, you could do a thousand problem sets, but if you don't get a chance to, to really build a financial statement for a small startup that really needs help from someone who understands how to use Excel and understands how financial statements mm-hmm. work, then do you really know how to build financial statements? Like yeah. not really, um, you know, how to, yeah. you know, how to put it together based on a problem set that was designed for learning. And it wasn't, you know, the, the kind of opaqueness, you know, obscurity that is the real world. And so mm-hmm. I think students really need that. I think the, you, you mentioned something earlier, can schools use this as a recruitment tool? Absolutely. And I think if you're a parent out there, you know, and your, your child is deciding on a program um, or if you're a student and you're deciding on a program, um, that is what I would ask if I were going through that process now is like, how many internships do students graduate with? How much experience are they gaining working with companies, working in teams throughout their courses? These are the questions that like most of the time they're like, what's the meal plan like for exactly. my, you know, my freshman boy? Cause he's hungry. Like, that's, <laughs> you know, that, he'll be fine. He'll be fed. Right. But will he be, you know, intellectually fed is a totally different, you know, ball of wax. And, you know, it's, it's very different in the higher ed environments. And, and, and by the way, like I see CapSource as a tool that can help you know, a nursing student, if they want to get, you know, into, into nursing versus if you're a business analytics master's student, or if you're an undergraduate, you know, psychology major, you know, you're each one of those people wants to get into a professional field, wants connections to that field. And we need to help structure their apprenticeships, structure internships, what field studies, you know, whatever you want to call them, they all need to, they have an arc right? It's, mm-hmm. it's a curriculum. Yep. And that's basically what our tool does is it helps you build that curriculum with intention, measure the productivity and the success of that collaboration. And so I think it's, I think it's a really special opportunity because we can partner with boot camps that want to just get their students into internships that are geared for computer science, right? And then we can also partner with, you know, undergraduate arts and sciences majors that you know, don't necessarily know what they can do with the powerful skills that they yeah. they've developed. Yeah. And I think that's what's really special about experiential learning. Well, for sure. I mean, just the, the term itself, the experiential, you know, learning is is not necessarily that you've got it figured out. I mean, it it really is exploratory too. I mean, it's it's giving people, I mean, especially depending on the the length of time that you're talking about internships, maybe you know, there's a, uh, there's a thing that, you know, where college students can go on like a a one-year gap program and like every, every month they're in a different country doing different things. So I can almost see even short-term versions of this where you're back, you're actually just kind of, you know, kind of dipping your toe into different industries to see, is this a, is this a good fit for my skill set and what I like to do? And, you know, like you did with the, the New York delis, you know, <laughs> at lunchtime instead of the, you know, finance. I mean, I was an accounting major in university for 15 minutes. I mean, that's about how long it took me to figure out this, this is not what I want to do for a living. So I, uh, I, I feel your pain, brother. I yeah. certainly feel your pain. It, yeah, it takes a I, special person. I, I love how you, you brought up the international component because one of our enterprise customers you know, coordinates international study experiences and their clients are basically schools that want to put their students through these programs. Yep. But the reality is more of those students and programs are demanding internships and collaboration mm-hmm. with industry because what an amazing way to learn about culture abroad, to learn about yeah. you know co- communities and businesses all abroad, right? And mm-hmm. language, right? And, and I think, you know, they, they've had a lot of success using our tool to kind of figure out how to connect companies with their students while they're abroad or in a virtual sense, right? Like collaborating on virtual projects with a company in Brazil or a company in Peru or a company in, 
you know, the Middle East and, and right. giving students, you know, it's a, the, the most amazing thing that we've learned by working across borders is that you realize that business challenges are very similar across all of those mm-hmm. areas. And so if you can really show students, you know, a, a way to triangulate how their skills can help, you know, a startup in, you know, Africa and, and you know, a, a high growth business in, in South America, like now they look how much value they think they can provide to the world. And that's what's motivating. And that's what's enlightening and inspiring. And it certainly opens their eyes to possibilities outside of, you know, where they grew up and, you know, maybe even the region of the country that they are looking at to, to like plant themselves. But I mean, it's a global village. We are, it's, you can be virtually any place on the planet in 36 hours. So, right. and, and the fact that, that across the world, I mean, business, is the the English is the lingua franca of, you know, of, of business across the country, across the world. So, I mean, that is kind of the common business vernacular. So, you know, we are already well suited, I think, as, as Americans, because, you know, we are English speaking to be able to kind of step into that world. But um, I just, I love the, the way that you, you guys obviously have thought through some things. And I think even, you know, probably been presented things by, by clients that said, Hey, have you thought about this or could you do this for us? You know, type thing that kind of grew your capacity and, and maybe even your, you know, your catalog of offerings. Yeah, I I believe it. I I believe you have, you have to learn from your customers. If you're Mm -hmm. lucky enough to have customers, you should be learning from them um, constantly asking them questions, what, what they need the tool to do. That's not doing what services we can offer that, you know, that would make their lives easier, add capacity, lighten the load, lighten the burden. Um, and so I think, you know, it's been really amazing to, to grow now a couple of companies that have gone from just an idea to, Hey, we have customers that we're managing. We have relationships. People are expecting things from us. They, they, they're looking for us to deliver outcomes um, that are based on some contractual agreement that you try to replicate across many different people um, and organizations. But I think that, that there's so much, inspiration that's in those customer conversations. And, you know, one thing that we're having now is a discussion as a team is like, how do you connect the sales funnel with the product development mm-hmm. process, you know, yep. like interdepartmental right. uh, cooperation and, and collaboration. And I think that's really um, something that is really fun. It's a big challenge, right? It's a big challenge, but it's really fun, you know, as a business owner to try and sort that out. It's not always external. I mean, sometimes even internally within a company, there are silos that are, that exist that, you know, interdepartmentally, they don't even communicate well. You know, they, there's no, there's no transfer of talent. There's no transfer of information even, or very little, it's very limited, you know, even interdepartmentally. But so I know that you, you talked about kind of your senior at Lehigh, you, you were asking professors about it, you know, is this a problem? But then you mentioned this is your second, like, like company. So what, how did the iteration happen? Is CapSource the second company that you've, you've created and what was different about what you created in Lehigh? How's, how's CapSource different? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, CapSource is the second education technology company I've worked on. I've also had the great pleasure of working with some mentors on starting up businesses and financial services and um, serving as kind of a marketing and sales role there, mm-hmm. um, started an aromatherapy company with some friends. So um, specifically related. Yeah, that to- hadn't generated any revenue yet, right? What? Well, <laughs> you know, is it, I think. I'm that sorry, it- profit. It may have generated revenue, it just hadn't True. generated any profit yet. <laughs> profit. Yeah, that's a very different number than, <laughs> exactly. uh, than revenue. But yeah, I think. You know, the first thing is it's not really a startup if, if it's not generating revenue. So the reality is, um, you know, you're, you're still in an idea phase until you get your first customer and then you're a startup. Um, and then can you scale it? That's a whole other question. Um, your question was, you know, how did, how did my first business, which was called Real-Time Cases, you know, how did I get from there to where I am now? Um, you know, beautifully went through the fundraising process with Real-Time Cases um, during my time there, we raised about $2 million, put all that capital to use, built the team, learned so much about, um, you know, human resources, technology resources, building, you know, tech from scratch and 
how do you go from product ideas to product development to product features is, is a really amazing thing. Um, I loved working on the technology product. I continue to love working on technology products. Um, and so, you know, throughout my time at Real Time Cases, um, it, it since kind of merged and was acquired by a company in Florida, and it's now called Curator Solutions. They do a lot more training and development for corporate. Um, and so it's a totally different business than what we started. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, I really liked our original kind of premise of bringing the real world into the classroom and yep. experiential learning. And so, you know, I kept hearing, and this is like, how do you connect partnerships or sales with product? I kept hearing in my sales calls um, that they were like, well, a case study sounds good, but can we do a collaboration? Like, can we actually work with the company? Can we like get feedback on our answers? And, you know, basically one of my clients said like, you know, a case study is not experiential learning. And I was like, I was like, really? But like the students are experiencing like the company and like, no, it's not an experiential learning exercise because there's no feedback loop. The students mm. need the feedback loop. And then that's really what helps them grow as young professionals because, you know, they get requirements, they work as a team, they deliver on their milestone, they get feedback, they iterate and include that feedback, and then they work towards their next milestone. And that's kind of how the real world works too, right? Like right. You, have a, you have a deadline, you deliver Either you crushed it or you didn't. You get feedback. You have more time to improve it. You've asked for help from your team members. So CapSource actually landed our first customer by like through my conversations as a real-time cases team member. Um, and so they were you know, still building these case studies that were video and content for the classroom, but they weren't interactive you know, with the company at all. Uh, we found the Fordham MBA program, which I actually still work with, um, who basically said, hey, instead of a case study, can you find me 10 companies to do consulting projects with for my MBAs? And I, that was my big aha moment. I was like, there's got to be so many different schools that are trying to do this and having trouble. Um, and so that's what kind of inspired the creation of CapSource, you know, registered a website and um, started serving that customer kind of you know, understood with my co-founders in real time that that was not the direction they wanted to go with the business. They definitely wanted to double down on going into industry and training and development and, and really focusing on developing contents less for education and more for training and development within companies. Mm. Um, so it was just, it was perfect timing for us to kind of set, like, go our separate ways and kind of double, double, double click on our interests. And right. you know, I, I love training and development within corporations, but um, you know, I think it's it's very different to get people within an organization to be more effective or efficient, as opposed to, I think when people are in school, when they're opting into the learning mindset and not the work mindset, you actually can like totally change their lives if you expose them to, you know, something new and innovative and different and creative. And so Absolutely I think that, agree. that's the tool of CAF sources. Like, can we kind of, you know, just, just slightly you know, change people's trajectory into a better place for them because they've learned, they've experienced, they've connected, they've networked. Um, and I think those are, are really important for, you know, young professionals. See, we've, we've talked so long. Now you're answering my questions before I ask them. So, I mean, some, I, I think you've like used AI on me or something. You figured out my, my questioning pattern and now you're answering them. But because I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, the, the process of the, of the software and the programs, how you build those programs, as I was thinking, you know, this could actually be used in, inside a company for like leadership development programs and, and things like that. And, I'm, and then, but I'm glad you clarified. And, and I, I, I think you have, you've done something that is so fundamental to good entrepreneurs is you, you haven't fallen to the shiny object syndrome, you know, <laughs> stay, stay focused. Let me, let, let's do our, you know, our McDonald's sandwich. Let's get it down pat, you know, so it gets replicable before yeah. we start doing something outside of scope, you know? So I, I want to applaud you for that because I, I'm, I'm just, I, it's shiny. We're chasing it. So I, uh, I really, I think that you're, you're, chance of success grow, goes up exponentially because you have really decided we're going to stay in our lane. We're going to stay in our niche and we're, we're going to be the best at it, you know, at, at that particular thing. Yeah. So I, I certainly I want to applaud that. you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and, you know, I, I would say, you know, 
we, we, we're, we're definitely not a good fit for training and development, especially with the current model. I think, you know, the nice thing about real-time cases, they, they merged with um, a company that was like a content management system mm-hmm. that helped them kind of really enter the world of like building content for the right types of right. Um, companies that need very nuanced training. And I think, you know, what, what I always say is that the best way to learn is to teach, right? And so you should obviously surround yourself with people that you learn from, but also allow themselves to learn from you. Like there's not a single mentorship relationship that I have um, that we don't learn from each other. And, and the reality is, you know, these programs, when you, when you ask, you know, a, a young, young emerging leader at your company to mentor a bunch of interns and you know, show them the ropes, what does your department do? What is your role responsible for? How does that fit into the bigger picture of the company? You know, whether you're a small startup or a really large, you know, startup or a really large corporation, you know, you, you really have to figure out how to motivate your young talent to stay there. And if you empower them to train and inspire you know, the, the, the next generation workforce, that's a really good way to do it, right? Like they have to prepare documentation that helps, mm-hmm. you know, themselves and also students better understand their role, right? Their responsibilities, their goals, their, how they fit into the bigger picture. And that's important to encourage people to think about. And, and the reality is most of the time, you know, leaders don't do that with their talent. They don't exactly. ask people, you know, hey, develop a process and then let's talk about improving it. Like that's just never the top priority. It's always mm-hmm. something else, you know, gets the priority over that. But if you said to someone, hey, yeah, we're going to add five people to your team, you know, on a part-time kind of remote basis to work on, you know, strategically solving a challenge and you just need to assign a mentor, you know, it's amazing because just the very little time that that mentor puts into adding structure to the experience, you know, there's so much value that comes out of the students. And so I just, I remember we're working with the Ronald McDonald House Cherries of Jacksonville, Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been an incredible partner of ours. Actually, my intro to business professor from Lehigh is the current executive director there. And that's how we made that connection. And so we've had them engage with about 11 universities and different teams of students to do, you know, totally different projects. And the, the project that they doubled down on is they need help with building a volunteer management system. Mm-hmm. So that essentially, you know, after COVID, during COVID, like how do they deal with, you know, check the box, like I've been vaccinated, like all that stuff, right? right? You know, it's just, you know, first of all, there's no chance that students would ever be thinking about like, mm-hmm. oh, what are the implications of volunteering at the Ronald McDonald House charities, you know, in the in the age of COVID? And so like you're, you know, we've we've put the mentor into place, you know, there it's the the head of volunteering, you know. Obviously, the executive director, Diane, is involved as well. And then the students, you know, with the little structure that the volunteer manager um, is, is, is putting into place, you know, is able to extract so much value out of, okay, if we're going to choose a vendor, who should it be and how much would it cost and how much time would it take to roll out and can it do these 10 things that you're going to try and figure out based on your interviews of our right. different team members. And like, that's the way that we want you know, young professionals to be approaching problem solving. And by the way, they'll learn like, hey, I don't want to be involved in, you know, development or choosing of technology. I'm not interested in volunteering. I'm not interested in nonprofits. I'm not interested in healthcare, right? Like all of those things Mm. are things that you can learn by doing a project like this. And the reality is there's there's less than 2 million internships and there's 20 million college students alone. And there's 80 million people, you know, between the age of 16 and 34. And so there's really not enough of those opportunities to like give people a taste of what's out there and help them connect and learn by doing. And so that's what Capsource aims to do is increase internship capacity. Um, And so the wonderful thing is the 180 companies that we worked with to date um, not a single one of them has an internship program, but now they kind of do because of the work that we're doing with them through CapSource. Now, listeners, did you hear that? He went he went full on Shark Tank on me there for a second. He he listed off the number of college you know students or, or people between eighteen and thirty four. He listed the number of internships. He listed the number of university students, and then he the next thing he's going to say is if we just captured one percent of that market, <laughs> and then Kevin O'Leary would say, no, no, no. Look, we're talking real numbers here. We're not talking about potential markets. So I, but I, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, so. I want you to, as we're kind of wrapping up today, I want you to give me an idea who your ideal corporate client is. 
Yeah, I think I think there's there's technically two. I think there's there's the probably the lower hanging fruit are the companies that know they've needed to really do better at connecting with the next generation at, you know, entry level talent acquisition, right. um, but don't really have any infrastructure built. Um, they're a really good client for us because they're itching for a solution. Um, and we use you know, case assessments to help you find the right candidates. Uh, and then we help build and manage those internship programs, which are a great tool for talent acquisition. Um, I think the second um, more like uh, other likely candidate is someone who does this that wants to systematize it and improve it a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah. Um, and so our tool, our process, our you know our our internship builder, um, all of that is is really designed to make the process easier to manage for the talent team because that at the end of the day, um, you know they might have teams across. 30 different departments and right. how are you going to, first of all, find out who's doing well and, you know, who wants to ultimately continue to work with you and, you know, what they're producing in terms of outcomes that are valuable. So um, the reality is, you know, startups gravitate towards us because they get a chance to work with schools for free. That's kind of our free offering for companies. Um, of course, the schools want to work with larger companies. So we got to figure out how to bring the larger outfits in as well. Um, I think the SMB um, that really just wants some kind of fresh set of eyes and, mm-hmm. and bright ideas um, is, is typically where I think we'll find the most value as a business um, and where we can deliver the most value. The large corporates, a lot of them have teams that are dedicated to, to building and managing yeah. internship programs. So yeah. unless they're really trying to shake things up, um, you know, I'm not sure that we're quite a fit for them yet. But you know, as we do this for you know the the, the medium to large business, um, you know, potentially we can start working with you know the Fortune 1000, if you will. Yeah, and, and but that's just it. I mean, so there's a thousand of those, but there's 350 thousand you know SMEs out there. Right. So I mean, you certainly have the you know kind of that blue ocean strategy. You have you have a, a lot of a lot of ocean out there to. to to swim and fish in, so to speak. But as we wrap up, so so tell me where the best place to to find you online for people that want to know more about CapSource. And and it, if as you're, we're wrapping up today, is there's anything you wanted to kind of close with that I haven't asked you about? I'd love to give you that space. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm an active LinkedIn user. You know, of course, feel free to to connect with me there um, just by searching my name or CapSource. Um, if you want to visit. Our website, capsource.io, um, you'll actually um, get a chance to learn about our offerings for educators and companies and students and really kind of find, you know, which area of internships you want um, help in. And, you know, we can actually get started. We can schedule some time um, to meet and, and learn more about each other directly through the website. Um, other than that, um, what would I like to kind of... And on. I mean, you know, the reality is, I think that, you know, we, we all need to kind of take a little responsibility over the next generation. I think uh, mm. you know, I've said this before on podcasts, but a lot of employers like to, you know, sit at the, at the, the, the doorstep of higher ed and complain about, you know, the skills gap. But, you know, the reality is, if, if you're not getting involved in the process, and you're not trying at all, you know, to interface with students to provide that you know, that in industry perspective earlier so that they can, that, so that they can start to foster some of those skills and competencies. Um, that, then frankly, you won't be around for, for very long as an organization, I think. Um, you know, one of the amazing statistics is, I think it's like 37, it's a it's tiny fraction of the amount of companies that Fortune 500s that were around in, in 1950 are mm. around today. It's like yeah. a 70 year period. It's like, 10%, I think less than 10% mm-hmm. of the companies. And so you have to think about like, those are the powerhouse companies of the day. Why are they gone completely? Like that's insane. And the reality is they fall out of touch with their, their next generation leader. Right. And like, that's what you're doing. You're, you're not thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking about, you know, 10 years from now. Yeah. And the reality is like, by thinking about 10 years from now, you create the roadmap to the future, because those people that you're bringing in who will be your leaders in 10 years are actually helping to co-create that strategy and take some responsibility over it. So that's kind of my, you know, my invitation for companies to start thinking about how are we, you know, how are we attracting the next generation? How are we preparing them, you know, for the very complex world that they're entering? 
Um, and how can we how can we get involved, right? How can we help? Um, and I think that's really where you know we stand to 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 kind of provide that assistance and in, in, in creating the bridge. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's so many benefits in just in just you know walking over that bridge, saying hello, shaking some hands, mentoring some students, you know, working on some projects, getting some new ideas that you don't even have to cloak it in like some goodwill, you know, uh, motive. Like there's truly a benefit for companies, um, you know, transactionally. Most companies say that they get, you know, around $5,000 worth of value by doing these class projects and, you know, upwards of 10,000 if they actually hire. And some of our programs, you know, the companies will hire the top 10 performers 10% of performers. Mm. And like that's, that's what we want to see is like yeah. you know, companies, they're doing this because they want to connect with the next gen. They're doing this and they're training that next gen. And then they're actually hiring the ones that are top performers. So we're, we're here to help and we're excited too. So thank you so much, Kevin, for the opportunity here. It was really great to, to be with you. I love the way you co- close with kind of the the bridge metaphor, and and not only are is is does the bridge need to be built, and is the bridge getting built, but you're also engaging the the young leader as part of the bridge building crew, you know. So so I mean, it has a much stronger foundation, and it's certainly more relevant, you know, as it's being built. But Jordan, I just want to applaud you for you know giving back and and building that into your ethos of who, you know, cap source is and really just playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Jordan, have a great day. I love it. Kevin, thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.